Here he, there he is. Good morning, Lowell. You're in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, we are delighted to have you join the conference. Lowell brings uh, a wonderful background. He was at FDA as a senior counsel, and uh, that is now being that experience is now be, being used uh, in his position at Hogan Lovells, a major international practice. Uh, of course, one of the largest food and drug law practices in the world. So Lowell, uh, thank you again for bringing Dr. Hahn to the table and we'll turn it over to you uh, to moderate the uh, session. Great. Well, good morning, and 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 thanks um, thanks so much for the opportunity to to, to speak today or to, to introduce Dr. Han, um, who I think will be on shortly, um, and and just um, connected with him this morning. So he'll be. We see him coming. Great, perfect. Um, and so with that, I can um, you know, I, I can start with um, you know just uh, introduction, and then we'll tee it up. I think. Um, um, Zan and, and um, Lauren said that um, I was going to tee up the initial question and then and then hand it off to, to, to you all. But so just um, I see Dr. Han um, has, has joined um, and, and great. So so good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, as, as um, Zan mentioned, I'm Lowell Zeta Council in the, the Pharma and Biotech practice at Hogan Lovells in, in DC. And this morning I'm privileged to introduce um, and to reconnect with my former boss, uh, Stephen Hahn, who served as 24th Commissioner of, um, of, of Food and Drugs. And um, as, as many of you know, Dr. Hahn has, has since joined um, Flagship Pioneering to help lead as uh, Chief Medical Officer of the, uh, the, the firm's preemptive medicine and health security initiative. Um, and in his role is responsible for designing, pursuing, um, and advancing explorations and companies related to this emerging initiative. Um, and he brings uh, decades of distinguished leadership in healthcare strategy, oncology, medical practice, uh, translational clinical research to the role. Um, and as um, um, I had the privilege of working with him um, at FDA, um, he was FDA commissioner from 2019 to 2021 and saw both COVID and non-COVID regulatory affair, uh, affairs matters including therapeutics, vaccine development, devices, diagnostics, and, and clinical trials. Prior to his appointment, he served as chief medical executive at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He was named deputy president and chief operating officer in 2017 and was responsible for day-to-day -day operations. And prior to MD Anderson, he served as assistant professor um, at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, where he was appointed chair of its radiation oncology department in 2005. Um, Dr. Han focused on his translational research efforts on the evaluation of tu tumor uh, microenvironment signal transduction pathways involved in tumor response to therapies and proton therapy, has authored more than 220 peer reviewed original research articles um, and has, has a lot of experience in, in medical product development. Um, he earned his medical degree from Temple and undergrad in biology from Rice um, and um, was an internal medicine resident at the University of California, San Francisco before completing a fellowship and residency at the National Cancer Institute um, in, in Bethesda, Maryland. So, so with that, uh, Dr. Chan, with that storied background, we welcome you to this morning's fireside chat, um, joined by um, several folks here and will be moderated by uh, myself, Sam Fleming um, and, and Lawrence Diamond here. Um, so Dr. Hahn, good morning and, and good to see you. Lowell, thank you. And uh, uh, Zan and Lawrence, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I learned a new term, Zoom, Zoomista, I think. I've got to get that. <laughs> right. I'll probably steal that from you just so you're not- <laughs> Please do. Up front. Yeah. yeah, same here. So, so Dr. Ron, we pulled uh, we, we have a few questions that we pulled together and prep for for today. Um, and I think um, you know we'd be eager to to, um, to and certainly invite your insights. And I think hopefully some of the discussion will help frame some of the um, um, the, the, the 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 subsequent panels and and issues to to kind of be impacted later throughout this week. Um, and as mentioned, I'll start off and and then we'll hand off to um, to, to to Zan here um, and Lawrence. 
So, so initially, I think many folks at the conference are eager to learn more about um, flagships initiative um, that, that, you're, that you're leading here. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit more about the initiative, its goals, um, you know, focus, whether it's focused on certain products or industries um, and sort of the issues that you guys have been focusing on. Yes, yeah, certainly, Lowell. And what's interesting about this is um, I thought long and hard about what I would do after uh, my tenure at the FDA. And, and I chose to work with uh, Nubara Fayer and Flagship Pioneering, and Nubar is our, our CEO um, and, and managing partner. And um, be, because they were have been very forward thinking, as you know, um, they created the company Moderna, but they are a platform approach and they invent, invest in science and in-house science um, and develop platforms for both therapeutics as, as well as vaccines, et cetera. And what I found interesting is that a couple of years ago, Nubar um, had proposed as part of flagship this initiative of preemptive medicine and health security. And it intrigued me because I think we can all acknowledge the fact that we were not equipped as a country, as a world to deal with the pandemic that we just faced, number one. And number two, I think we all recognize the fact that in the developing world, and, and I mean, in the developed world, but perhaps also in low and middle income countries, we're facing a cliff of sorts economically and financially because of the burden of chronic disease. It's not just a financial issue, uh, though. As a cancer doctor, it's a personal issue. And, you know, patients, people are suffering from chronic diseases that that affect their longevity, but, but also their quality of life. And so we really do need as a country, but as a world to get a handle on this issue of, of chronic disease and how it affects um, many people around the globe. So there's two pillars to this effort. One is preemptive medicine and the other is health security. And I'll just briefly describe them. Health security um, is really, how do we create a health shield? We spend a lot of money on our national security mm -hmm. with respect to the military, protecting against external threats for safety. We spend a lot of time and effort on our personal security. But what about our personal health security and also our global health security? So what if, uh, we ask at Flagship, we could create um, a shield that protects us against external threats, not just pathogens, but other external health threats, and actually predict what would be, for example, with COVID-19, the next set of variants of concern we have, to, we have to address. And then on the preemptive medicine, what about diseases like asthma, obesity, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cancer? What if we could identify 20 years before those diseases develop a pre-disease state as yet undefined, but potentially could be defined, Maybe it's not 20, maybe it's 10 years, maybe identify those and then create interventions. And they'd have to be interventions with very wide therapeutic indexes, which creates another issue with respect to clinical development of the regulatory side of things. But the bottom line is what if we could identify those diseases? So that would create some approach to diagnostics, if you will, and then intervention to either prevent or slow the progression of disease. Again, I think this is an imperative for us. It's an imperative for many uh, peoples around the world. Um, and I'm really excited about our efforts in this regard. And, and we are trying to capitalize on the great scientific achievements that we've seen over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Wow, well, that is music to our ears, Stephen. Uh, I love the term preemptive medicine. That is certainly what we are about here, of course wanting to start early. And you raise another very important uh, point, and it's not just about drugs. It's, of course, anything that works and regulated products and uh, the basics like nutrition and uh, good exercise habits and so forth. So it's just amazing that you are now taking to the private sector this uh, logical progression in your career to get ahead of disease and, and start um, uh, preventing it as opposed, opposed to managing it. By the way, I'm glad to know, well, please go ahead. No, I just, one point you made, which is really important is about diet and exercise. We all know how difficult it is to convince people that this is the sort of right pathway. And um, I, I love that you brought social scientists to the table because this is going to be a lot 
about behavioral aspects. And we know that there's science there. And, and I'm not talking about, of course, manipulating people. What I'm talking about is how do you get people to become empowered and invested in their health and well being um, and, and really make it something that becomes a part of our lives? Sorry. Yeah, well, that that is just right on the mark. And Larry, I see you were about to chime in. Right. Well, I think I think it's very important that uh, you were able to bring up uh, diet uh, and exercise, because uh, if we had a precise uh, tool that will tell somebody that in X number of years they're going to get Alzheimer's or in X number of years they're going to get type 2 diabetes or X number of years they're going to get cancer without a therapeutic intervention that's uh, relatively safe and highly effective. Uh, I don't know how well it would go over even with myself, but yep. since there is uh, for two of the major problems we face, uh, some things that you can do even this morning uh, to change the trajectory, I think that's uh, more than convenient. It's absolutely essential. I'd like to hear your comments. You know, Lawrence, it is absolutely essential. And you're right. I mean, I think about it myself. Someone tells me theoretically I could have X disease 20 years from now or 10 years from now or whatever. It's all theoretical. And a lot of this is in the lexicon. What language do we use to describe it? What and, and how do we frame this so that people, again, feel empowered and, and able and willing to do these things? But you bring up Alzheimer's is a great idea. I mean, if, if we had, and I'll say biomarker, but some sort of risk assessment, we can just leave it at that. Um, and, and there was some certainty behind that, you know, diet, exercise, alcohol, sleep, all those things that we are pretty sure of right now are associated. But the other things also are, let's start bringing some science to other parts of the, if you will, therapeutic world. We all know that the nutraceutical, medical food, et cetera, pathways at the agency um, are ones that um, are not, there's not a whole lot of oversight. And um, in the medical profession, as you probably know, there's been criticism of the fact that they, these, some of these things haven't been studied rigorously. So what if we brought science to the table there? What if we actually did an evaluation? What if we learned about some of these compounds, et cetera, that have a very wide therapeutic index, as you point out, are safe. And then we brought real rigor to the clinical development and then some sort of regulatory framework to provide the, the stamp of approval. We could really start to move the needle. And again, I think it could be supplemental to some of these other behavioral changes we're talking about. Well, again, I think one of the uh, issues that is uh, really important is that one of the most decisive things we can do is uh, moving exercise, and we don't have to put the term suitable on it. So it's, oh. it's uh, absolutely uh, a gift uh, that uh, it, it's so very important and uh, changes in healthcare. You go to uh, certain countries in uh, Europe and everyone is uh, bicycling, not uh, sitting uh, on their backside, uh, even getting to work. So. Uh, societal changes, I think, are going to be important. I agree. And Lawrence, there was a really nice paper just recently published in JAM. It's a case a control cohort study that looked at number of steps per day. You know, a lot of people count their steps. And it was a very dramatic effect. If you had more than, I think it was 7,150, I'm probably misquoting the number, but it was in the low 7,000s, excuse me. Um, if you had those steps versus you didn't, there was a substantial, and I'm, I'm talking a significant magnitude, 50% or more relative reduction in cardiovascular mor mortality. And so, you know, I, we can quote that all till we want, but really getting people on board with the fact that what you just described is one very small step that could make a big difference in longevity and, yeah. and well-being. 7,100 small steps for man and you get to uh, have better <laughs> longevity if we have to have a Neil Armstrong uh, sound bite for that but oh you're you're so right and it's it's so important on the pseudical side there's a lot of work to be done as you know better than almost everyone here and uh that's going to be uh complex to implement what are your your thoughts about that yeah and just one other thing that i just wanted to mention which i failed to initially and that is one of the things we're very very focused on a flagship is that we need to make sure that all of these interventions are available to everyone. 
That's and right. particularly those who are the least advantaged and the ones that have the least access to care. Ironically, one of the major lessons for me during the pandemic was, in fact, that those who could have benefited the most from innovation were those who were the most, not only uh, didn't have access necessarily to innovative products, but also were the most mistrustful of science and medicine. And we need, um, we need to fix that. And we need to have conversations and acknowledge that's going on. So we're really focused on the how can we make sure that this, this sort of approach is available to everybody, not just those who you know, might be able to buy something off of, of Amazon on a regular basis. So, well, I, uh, yeah, sorry. Well, I know that Adrian Berg loves that uh, theme and, yes. and uh, couldn't agree with you more about health equity and health equity for all as being the key objective. And let me just show you, this is my watch, and this is what measures my 10,000 steps. <laughs> but Esther Dyson, one of our speakers, who's going to be on the equity panel and on the behavior panel, she is endowing these watches to children in underserved populations. So now that is a private nonprofit way, but we're looking for a public policy way to make sure that everybody has access, and we're going to get it. We are, and it gets a little bit to what Lawrence asked, and I'll, I'll just elaborate because I think those two issues are tied. The other big lesson I learned at the FDA um, that I probably should have learned in academia but didn't, Lawrence, was the importance of the private sector. We can have great ideas at Penn and MD Anderson, but if we don't commercialize them, they don't get to people. Um, and we learned, certainly with vaccines last year, that we could do some pretty amazing things if we put our minds to it and the urgency was there. And my personal feeling is that the urgency has to be present for preemptive medicine and health security, just like it was for COVID. That we need, and I love the, the, uh, you know, the, the steps for mankind. The, let's do the moonshot. I, I love that analogy because to me, it, it's a social, economic, by the way, national security imperative, but also a moral imperative for us to do this. And so I know that sounds fairly dramatic, but I, I do feel strongly about it. But the private sector, we've got to engage the private sector. It's one of the reasons I went to the private sector and not back to academia, because I could see what the private sector would do once they were engaged and focused. Now, the private sector needs oversight. Let's face it, the FDA needs to be there to make sure products are safe and effective. So we've got to figure that one out but we can actually enhance and, and stimulate innovation. And we need to be really careful not to put artificial barriers in the way of innovation. And we can all sort of discuss what that means, but we should have a very high threshold for anything that we think gets in the way of, of innovation with the appropriate safeguards to make sure that the American public and the global public are protected. So I am really interested in this topic, Lawrence. And as you know, the, the pathway for drugs drug development is fairly well circumscribed. Now it's slow, it takes a long time and it takes a huge investment of capital, um, but it's been successful. And if you look at cancer, the number of approvals we've seen in the oncology cancer of excellence uh, model at the FDA has shown that number one, <clears throat> if you used a sort of personalized medicine biomarker driven approach to, to therapeutics, I'll just use that as an example, and you, you use at times surrogate or intermediate um, endpoints, um, you can actually accelerate drugs, getting them to the market, um, as long as you understand the safety. And then on maybe the back end in the post-marketing setting, you can do some more studying to make sure that you have the absolute uh, correct labeling. And sometimes you need refinement of that labeling. And sometimes you're gonna need to pull a, a drug off the market, but it's a model that I think has really enhanced innovation in the cancer sphere. And although we don't know the effect of COVID and I'm very worried about the, the whole issue related to delayed screening, what we have seen over the last five to 10 years, according to the American Cancer Society, is a substantial reduction in cancer mortality, which I think is probably related to screening, but also to the therapeutics that, that we're seeing, which come directly from the bench and from science. So why can't we take that and replicate that for a lot of other diseases? Why can't we incent the private sector using a variety of interesting approaches? Accelerated approval would be one, but also why don't we incent the private sector to actually make these new innovations available to the underserved? So not only available, have a program for making sure that that happens after approval, but include them in the development process. And I'll tell you why. 
one of the things I learned during the pandemic, particularly around vaccines, talking to a variety of patient groups and groups that represented the underserved. And by the way, th this knows no gender, racial, or, or any sort of boundaries in terms of underserved and lack of trust in medicine and science. It's out there. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. But if you talked to the to the to these groups that represent people um, in these in these in these parts of our society, what you learn is a couple of things. Folks want us to acknowledge that there is, in fact, mistrust, and that there is uh, some work that we need to do. But they also want to be involved in the process. And so, why wouldn't we incent those who include the underserved in their clinical development? really have discussions, really understand what that means, really get them on board with this conceptually, but also involve them in a very ethical um, uh, way. And so I think you know, we could create, similar to what we did with Operation Warp Speed and Vaccines, a framework that would incent the private sector to help us do this. Because I don't think government alone, I don't think academia alone can do this, but I think if we form partnerships and we incent the private sector, we can, we can make that happen. Um, and I'm really confident of that. And it may sound like um, it's self-serving because I'm now at flagship, but given what we saw last year, I think it would be hard to deny that the private sector teamed up with academia and, and government really did a pretty tremendous job with respect to vaccines. I think well, all music to our ears, Stephen. So Thomas Sir has a, a question for you. Dr. Hahn, I found your description of what uh, is going on at flagship pioneering at Nubar and obviously has a reputation for these big, bold uh, visions. Uh, and, and I understand how you can return, uh, get a return on investment for your, uh, uh, for your investors for a Moderna kind of investment uh, for COVID-19. What I wonder about, and I'd love to, I'm really looking forward to seeing how you all invest, is how you can make money in things like food, nutrition, and exercise, if that's a, a, a sector. And uh, overall, we've been struggling with how to transition from a practice of medicine that focuses on treating ill people when they walk in the door to keeping them healthy. How can doctors and providers and practitioners and businesses, uh, business models, uh, make as much or more money keeping people healthy as opposed to when they walk in uh, in dire need and they need, to, they need treatment. So I don't know if you can comment on some of yep. those other aspects of, please. Yes, so, so Thomas, um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, it's, it's audacious, if you will. And um, there, there, there certainly is an interest in value creation. Um, and I, I don't deny that. Uh, but value creation, if we can align incentives for everyone, the individual patient, employers, governments, um, as, as well as investors who invest in these. So I, I, uh, the, the business model associated with this um, needs to be created. Um, and just like 12 years ago, folks talked about mRNA vaccines as a platform, and then we, you know, we heard about Moderna, um, this has got to have the same sort of effort. So, so you're right, um, I, I don't think we're likely to be able to charge people for exercise, God, God willing, terrible, or the right diet, but we could create a framework of information and knowledge that, could that could, folks could access to help with that. But also let's create pathways where we can take very simple compounds that are generally recognized as safe. I'm using an FDA term now, grass, um, and actually rigorously study those. And you know, instead of paying ten dollars for your ibuprofen at the, you know, drugstore, maybe you're paying five or seven dollars for something that has been studied in a randomized clinical trial and known to prevent progression of X disease. I don't know. I'm throwing these things out, and you know. Um, uh, Lawrence, you're probably smiling there because this academic at the FDA is talking about business. <laughs> Please take that with a grain of salt for sure. But my, my point is, we just like we didn't know about these other platforms that have been de developed, we don't know about what this business model will be like moving forward. One thing I can tell you, if we don't try, if the private sector doesn't go there, if we don't see and create value there, it probably isn't going to happen in the time frame that we need it to happen in. Which really gets me to another point, Thomas, which I think is linked to what you said, which is that we need regulatory pathways for this that don't require 20, 30 years. 
you know, I want to live to see that we have an intervention that prevents Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and a variety of other diseases that are really vexing and, and affect people substantially. Um, that, that's really important because we have so many people suffering. And so think about what I said with respect to <clears throat> accelerated approvals. Um, and I'll take it as an example. We have, we have an example of a biomarker, if you will, of cardiovascular disease from the Framingham and other studies, and that's cholesterol. So we measure cholesterol. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine, you know, probably 30 years ago. So what cholesterol? I mean, not 30, maybe 50 years ago. But what we learned, of course, was that this was a fairly good marker, and particularly in the presence of diabetes, and that if we could put people on drugs like statins, we could reduce cardiovascular mortality. Now, that took us a long time to figure that out. It cannot take us 50 years to figure this out. And so what are the pathways that allow us to accelerate progress to get to an answer in five to seven to 10 years? And so I go back to two things. One is what we're doing in cancer. Let's have the same level of urgency. But number two, let's figure out um, if we can use intermediate and surrogate endpoints end, end to actually facilitate the development and to the market progress of some of these compounds. We've, we've had a lot of um, controversy over the summer regarding a decision that was made regarding a, an Alzheimer's drug. And of course, there was a cost issue associated with that, which the agency is not allowed to consider. But what you saw that I think was very interesting, and I encourage people to go to the documents that the FDA released, who was at the table discussing that decision behind closed doors? It was Rick Pazder of the Office of, of Oncology or the Center for Oncology Excellence. Not because this is oncology and not, I'm not passing judgment on the decision, but the point was, how do you use these pathways in, 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 the, in a manner that makes sense, you have data and science for, and I don't wanna argue the points around Alzheimer's because God knows I'm no expert on this, but the point is, can you get to that point where these intermediate or surrogate endpoints allow us to accelerate the development of interventions that could potentially make a difference? And then how do you do those studies both before and after marketing? And I think we should be very much interested in creating these regulatory frameworks to incent the private sector to do this with, again, the appropriate safeguards um, and with you know, I, I, I believe an approach that gets these, particularly with safe compounds that have a wide therapeutic index to people as quickly as possible. Hey, my friend, Amy Abernathy will tell you, let's use real world evidence to help collect after the fact and collect data from people using their phones and apps to actually build that. I mean, think about what we did during the pandemic. Have we ever had vaccines that have been given to 500 million people in under a year? that we have collected data on. There, there are no vaccines in the history of mankind that we have the safety and efficacy data that we have on these vaccines. And I probably am bridging into areas you don't want me to bridge into, but- to Well, on know, the I, contrary. In fact, you, you've set up the conference so perfectly, a number of key themes, but we're gonna drill down into biomarkers, regulatory pathways, clinical trial designs, and commercial models. Again, going back to you and the private sector now, how do we uh, create an environment that promotes the development of products, whatever they are, whether regulated or not, that will be available to everybody, will be affordable and will be widely used? And ultimately, how do we get that evidence? That's the big challenge that we're gonna grapple with today. That, Zan, that, that, I mean, that, is, that is the big challenge, but we must do it. Um, and we have to enable you know, folks in academia, um, the regulators who have a huge responsibility and the private sector to do this. We can, we showed it during COVID. Again, I, as much as COVID was a devastation for the world, we, we have to take the lessons learned. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you just one brief example. Think about what the United Kingdom did with the recovery trial. You know, started in March, Results reported out in, in June, um, incredibly pragmatic, two-page consent form, very simple case report forms, very inexpensively done, and had an answer to five major questions that we needed in the middle of the pandemic, dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine, others. The point being, we can do this if we get out of our way and we facilitate it getting done. So true. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the issues that uh, concerns me, we talk about uh, technology, wearables, 
uh, as our friends, but there's a big segment of the population, and I'm talking about the United States, that uses one of the great scientific uh, advances of modern times, uh, the internet and some of the technology platforms, and they use it against scientific evidence. How do we deal with that? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, Lawrence. And it's the bane and the, but also the positive of our modern world is some of these platforms are used for uh, messages that aren't accurate. Um, but I think most of us can agree that, um, you know, one of our most precious freedoms is the ability to speak out and speak our mind. Certainly that's true in academia. That being said, um, we have to combat it with reason and we have to combat it with conversations. You know, I've been on TV lately talking about the unvaccinated and, um, you know, I, I do not actually believe COVID is a, a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Um, I, I think what we have to do, just like I would as a cancer doctor for someone who doesn't want to follow a prescribed course of treatment is to have a conversation. And by the way, showing respect and having a conversation and, and throwing out what the data are and the information, you're not always going to convince people, but doing that one by one, but also in groups um, and treating people with respect for their point of view, I think will get us a lot further. And so we just have to keep at it. And we have, to, we have to put the truth out there and we have to show the data. Again, it's irrefutable for these vaccines. How many people have received the vaccines and what the data show, it's publicly available. And we just have to continue to emphasize that for the safety and efficacy side of things. People can have autonomy and make decisions, but they have to have the information and we have to combat the misinformation. And I think we can do it. We have to do it as a community. Stephen. You have been inspiring to us, and I know our audience. I can't thank you and Flo enough for uh, being our first up uh, speaker, and we could not have had a better introduction for this conference. So we look forward to collaboration. We'll keep uh, following your progress, and we hope that you'll uh, come back again next year. We'd love to have you. Would love to be back. Thank you very much. It's really nice meeting everybody and have a great conference. Thank you so much, Stephen. Bye-bye.